And Quiet Flows the Dawn, Part 2, by Mikhail Sholokhov, continued. The Cossacks will not condemn any government in which there are representatives of the parties of national freedom. But we are Cossacks, and the government should be our own Cossack government. How are we to interpret that remark when Bronstein and such men are at the head of the Soviet? Russia has trusted them, and we shall trust them. Will you have relations with them? Yes. Kalyadin drummed with his fingers and asked inquiringly, What have you in common with the Bolsheviks? We want to have Cossack self-government in the Don region. Yes, but surely you know that on February 17th a military council is to be called. The members will be re-elected. Will you agree to joint control? No, Podtelkov raised his eyes and replied firmly. If you are in the minority, we shall dictate our will to you. But that will be coercion. Yes. Bagayevsky turned his eyes from Podtelkov to Krivoshlikov and asked, Do you recognize the military council? Only in so far as... Podtelkov shrugged his shoulders. The regional military revolutionary committee will call a congress of representatives of the people. It will work under the control of the military forces. If the congress doesn't satisfy us, we shall not recognize it. And who are to be the judges in this matter? Kalyadin raised his eyebrows. The people, Podtelkov proudly threw back his head. After a short interval, Kalyadin spoke again. All noise died away in the hall, and the low, autumnally lackluster tones of his voice sounded clearly in the silence. The government cannot abdicate its powers at the demand of the Regional Military Revolutionary Committee. The present government has been elected by all the population of the Don, and only they and not individual sections can demand that we abdicate our powers. You are blind instruments in the hands of the Bolsheviks. You are doing the will of German mercenaries, not realizing the colossal responsibility to the Cossacks which you are taking on yourselves. I advise you to reconsider the matter, for you are bringing terrible misery on your native land by entering into conflict with the government which reflects the will of the entire population. I shall not cling to my authority. A great military council is to be called, and it will accomplish the destinies of the country. But until it meets, I must remain at my post. For the last time, I advise you to think over your position. Podtelkov pushed back his chair and replied tensely, stuttering with agitation, seeking words expressing an overwhelming power of conviction. If the military government could be trusted, I would willingly renounce all our demands. But the people do not trust it. It is not us, but you who are beginning the civil war. Why have you given the shelter of the Cossack land to these runaway generals? That is why the Bolsheviks are coming to make war on our gentle dawn. I will not submit to you. You will pass over my dead body first. I do not believe that the military council can save the dawn. Why are you sending your partisans against the miners? Tell me, what guarantee is there that the military government will avoid civil war? The people in the front-line Cossacks are on our side. A laugh, like a rustling wind, ran through the hall, and angry exclamations against Podtyalkov were heard. He turned his flushed face in their direction and shouted, making no attempt to hide his bitter anger. You're laughing now, but you'll be weeping before you're done with. He turned back to Kalyadin and fixed his eyes on him. We demand that you hand over the government to us, the representatives of the toiling people, and clear out all the bourgeoisie and the volunteer army. With Kalyadin's permission, several speakers from the Don military government attempted to talk over the members of the Revolutionary Committee to a different point of view. The hall grew blue and heavy with tobacco smoke. Beyond the windows, the sun was drawing near to the end of its daily journey, Frozen fir branches clung to the outer panes. At last, Lagutin could endure it no longer. Interrupting one of the speakers, he turned to Kalyadin. Come to a decision. It's time to end this. Bagayevsky whispered reprovingly, Don't get agitated, Lagutin. Take a drink of water. It's dangerous for anyone prone to epilepsy to get agitated. And besides, it's not the thing to interrupt speakers. This isn't a Soviet here. After a moment, Kalyadin rose. 
His reply had been previously prepared, and he had already issued instructions for a large force to advance in the direction of Kamienska. But he was playing for time, and he ended the conference with a procrastinating suggestion. The Dawn government will consider the Revolutionary Committee's proposals and will give an answer in writing by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. The reply of the military government handed to the delegates of the Military Revolutionary Committee the next morning constituted a complete rejection of the committee's proposals and called for the dissolution of the committee and the submission of its forces to the existing regional military council. It further proposed that the Military Revolutionary Committee should participate in a joint deputation to the Bolshevik forces with a view to negotiating for a peaceful settlement of the question of their advance into the dawn. This last proposal was accepted by the delegates, and Lagutin and Skotchkov became members of the deputation sent to Taganrok. Podchelkov and the others were detained for the time being in Novicherkas. But meantime, Kalyedin's forces, under the command of Colonel Chornitsov, had occupied the station of Lihi and continued their advance towards Kamienska, occupying that town on January 30th. The revolutionary forces had to evacuate Kamienska in a hurry. The depleted Cossack companies crowded pell-mell into the trains, abandoning everything that could not easily be carried. The lack of organization of a resolute officer who would assemble and order their really quite considerable forces was making itself felt. During those days, a captain named Golubov was outstanding among the elected commanders. He took command of the militant 27th Cossack Regiment and at once ruthlessly restored order. The Cossacks submitted to him implicitly, recognizing that he had qualities that the regiment lacked. The ability to weld it into a unity, to allot duties, and to take command. During the evacuation, he shouted at the Cossacks who were slow in loading the wagons, What's the matter with you? Are you playing hide-and-seek? Damn you, get on with it! In the name of the revolution, I order you to submit immediately. What? Who's that demagogue? I'll shoot him, the scum. Silence! You're a sabotager and a secret counter-revolutionary, and no comrade. And the Cossacks did submit. Many of them even liked his hectoring ways. For they still had hankerings after the past. In the old days, the biggest bully had always been the best commander in the Cossacks' eyes. The detachments of the Military Revolutionary Committee retreated to Gluboka. The virtual command passed into the hands of Golubov. In less than two days, he had reorganized the scattered forces and taken the necessary steps to hold Gluboka. At his demand, Grigor Melyakov was placed in command of a division consisting of two companies of a reserve regiment and one company of the Ottoman regiment. As twilight was falling on February 2nd, Gregor went out to make the round of the outposts set along the railway line. The night promised to be frosty, and a light breeze was blowing from the east. The sky was clear, the snow scrunched beneath his feet. The moon rose slowly and one-sidedly like an invalid going upstairs. Beyond the houses, the steppe smoked a dusky lilac. It was the evening hour when all outlines, colors, and distances are obliterated, when daylight is still inextricably entangled with the night, and everything seems unreal and fluid. At this hour, even scents have their own more subtle shades. After making the round, he returned to his quarters. His host, an employee on the railway, prepared the samovar and sat down at the table. Are you going to attack, he asked. I don't know, Gregor replied. Or are you going to wait for them here? We shall see. That's quite sound. I don't think you've anything to attack with, and then it's better to wait. I went through the German war as a sapper, and I know tactical strategy thoroughly. Your forces are small. They'll be enough, Gregor endeavored to avoid the disagreeable conversation. But the man maintained a zealous fire of questions, hovering about the table and scratching his lean belly beneath his waistcoat. Plenty of artillery? Guns? Cannon? You've been in the army. Don't you know a soldier's duty? Gregor said with cold anger, and he rolled his eyes so violently that the man started back. What right have you to question me as to the numbers of our troops and our plans? 
I'll have you arrested and cross-examined. Lord, officer, my dear. The man turned pale and almost choked with anxiety. I was stupid, stupid, pardon me. Soon afterward, six Cossacks of the Second Reserve Regiment, who were also billeted in the house, returned and sat down to drink tea, laughing and talking noisily. Grigor was half asleep, but he caught snatches of their conversation. One of them was telling of an incident of the same day. I was present when it happened. Three miners from Gorlovka came along from mine number 11 and said they had collected a force, but they hadn't any weapons. So they asked us to give them what we could spare. And Podjelkov, I heard him myself, tells them, Go and ask elsewhere, comrades. We haven't any here. But how does he make out that we haven't any? I know we've got reserves of rifles. That wasn't the point. He was jealous of the peasants interfering. And quite right, too, another exclaimed. Give them weapons and they may fight or they may not. But as soon as the question of the land comes up, they'll be laying their hands on it. The first speaker thoughtfully tapped his spoon against his glass, keeping time to his words as he replied deliberately, No, that sort of thing won't do. The Bolsheviks will meet us halfway for the sake of all the people, and we're Bolsheviks of a kind. First we must kick Kalyadin out, then we shall see. But my dear lad, a high-pitched voice remarked with conviction, don't you see that we've got nothing to give away? We get perhaps three acres of good land in the share-out, and the rest is good for nothing. So what can we give them? They won't take from you, but there are others with too much land. As he dozed off, Grigor heard the Cossacks settling down on the floor for the night, still arguing about the land and how it should be divided. They were awakened before daybreak by the sound of a shot right outside the window. Grigor drew on his shirt, fumbling a moment with the sleeve, seized his tunic and put on his boots as he ran. Shots rattled out in the street. A cart rumbled by. Someone cried in a voice of fear outside the door, To arms! To arms, damn you! The Chornyatsov forces had driven back the outposts and were pouring into the town. Riders dashed past in the gray, misty darkness. Men were running, their boots clattering. A machine gun had been set up at the corner of the street. A chain of some thirty Cossacks barred the road. Another group ran off down the street. A battery thundered by, the horses galloping, the outriders waving their whips. Machine guns suddenly started to sputter somewhere close at hand. In the next street, a field kitchen had been overturned in its headlong flight by one wheel hooking against a fence post. You blind devil, couldn't you see it? roared a mortally terrified voice. With difficulty, Grigor collected his company and led it at a gallop towards the station. They found the Cossacks already retreating in a dense stream. Where are you going? Grigor seized one of the foremost by his rifle. Let go! the Cossack pulled. Let go, you swine! What are you stopping me for? Can't you see we're retreating? Knock him over! Sweep the fool aside! others shouted. Close to a long warehouse at the end of the station, Grigor tried to deploy his company in extended formation, but a fresh wave of fleeing Cossacks swept them aside. The Cossacks of Grigor's company began to mingle with the crowd and fled back with them into the streets. Stop! Halt or I'll fire! Grigor roared, trembling with fury. But they paid no attention to him. A hail of machine gun bullets raked the street. The Cossacks dropped to the road for a moment, crawled closer to the walls, and fled into the side turnings. You won't hold them now, Melyakov, a troop officer shouted as he ran past. Grigor followed him, grinding his teeth and waving his rifle. The panic, which had taken possession of the Cossacks, ended in complete and disorderly flight from Gluboka, most of the equipment being left behind. Only at daybreak was it possible to reassemble the companies and throw them into a counterattack. Livid and sweating, Golubov, in an open sheepskin jacket, ran along the files of his own 27th Regiment, shouting in a metallic, steely voice, Step out! No lying down! March! March! The battle began at six. The mixed forces of Cossacks and Red Guards from Varanyezh swept on in a dense mass, trimming the snowy ground with a dark lacework of figures. A freezing wind was blowing from the east. 
Beneath the wind-driven clouds, the dawn showed blood red. Gregor sent off half the Ottoman company to cover the 14th battery and led the others into the attack. The first shell fell far beyond the Chonyatsov forces. The tattered orange and blue flag of the explosion was flung upward. A second shell whistled overhead. A moment of tense silence, emphasized by rifle fire, then a distant echo as it burst. The enemy forces in front began to lie down. Screwing up his eyes against the wind, Gregor thought with a feeling of satisfaction, We've got the range. On the right flank were the companies of the 44th Regiment. Golubov was leading his own regiment in the center. Gregor was on his left. Beyond were Red Guard detachments covering the left flank. Three machine guns had been allotted to Gregor's companies. Their commander, a thick-set Red Guard with morose face and hairy hands, directed their fire excellently, paralyzing the enemy's attempts at an offensive. He remained the whole time close to the machine gun that was moving forward with the Ottoman Cossacks. At his side was a stocky woman in a soldier's tunic. As Gregor passed along the file of Cossacks, he thought angrily, a petticoat, going into battle, and he can't leave his woman behind. He should have brought his children in his feather bed with him, too. The commander of the machine gun detachment came up to him. Are you in command of this section? he asked. Yes. I'll direct a barrage fire in front of the Ottoman half company. The enemy are preventing their advance. All right, Grigor assented. At a shout from the direction of the momentarily silent machine gun, he turned and heard the bearded machine gunner roar furiously, Bunchuk, we shall melt the gun, you human devil. You can't go on like that. The woman in a soldier's tunic went down on her knees. Her black eyes, burning under her kerchief, reminded Grigor of Axenia. And for a second he stared at her with an unwinking gaze, holding his breath. At noon, an orderly galloped up from Golubov with instructions for Gregor to withdraw his two companies from their positions and to encircle the right flank of the enemy, doing so unobserved if possible. He was to strike from the flank immediately the main forces opened a decisive attack. Gregor at once drew off his companies, and after mounting them, led them in a semicircle for eight miles along a valley. The horses stumbled and floundered in the deep snow, which sometimes reached to their chests. Gregor listened to the sound of firing and looked anxiously at his watch, a trophy taken from the hand of a dead German officer in Romania. He directed their course by a compass, but even so deviated rather more to the left than necessary. They emerged into the open field over a broad down. The horses were smoking with sweat and wet in the groins. Gregor gave the order to dismount, and was the first to climb the hill. The horses were left in the valley. The Cossacks crawled after him up the steep slope. He looked back, saw more than a company of Cossacks scattered over the snowy rise, and felt stronger and more confident. Like most other men in battle, he was strongly possessed by the herd instinct. Taking in the situation of the battle at a glance, he realized that he was late by half an hour at the least. With a daring strategic maneuver, Golubov had almost cut off the rear of the Chornitsov forces, sending out flanking detachments on both sides, and was now striking at them from in front. The rifle fire was rattling like shot in a frying pan. Shrapnel was sweeping the demoralized ranks of the enemy, and the shells were falling thickly. Forward, Grigor shouted. He struck with his companies on the flank. The Cossacks advanced as though on parade. But a dexterous Chornyatsov machine gunner sprayed them so healthily with bullets that they were glad to lie down after losing three of their number. In the early afternoon, Gregor was struck by a bullet which pierced the flesh above the knee. Feeling a burning pain and the familiar nausea from loss of blood, he grated his teeth. He crawled out of the line and jumped to his feet, half delirious with the shock and shaking his head. The pain was all the greater as the bullet had not passed out, but remained buried in the muscle. The burning, lacerating agony prevented all movement, and he lay down again. As he lay, his mind vividly recalled the attack of the 12th Regiment in the Transylvanian Mountains when he had been wounded in the arm. 
Gregor's assistant took charge of the companies and ordered two Cossacks to lead Gregor back to the horses. As they sat him on his horse, they sympathetically advised him to tie up the wound. Gregor was already in his saddle, but he slipped down and, dropping his trousers, frowning with pain, hurriedly bandaged the inflamed, bleeding hole. Then, accompanied by his orderly, he rode back by the same circuitous route through the valley to the spot where the counterattack had begun. Drowsy with sleep, he stared at the traces of horse hoofs in the snow, at the familiar outlines of the valley, and the incidents on the hillside already seemed to have happened a long time ago. For two miles they rode through the valley. The horses began to tire with the heavy going. Make for the open! Gregor snorted to his orderly and turned his own horse up the drifted slope of the down. In the distance, they saw the scattered figures of the dead lying like settled crows. On the very horizon, a tiny riderless horse was galloping. Gregor saw the main forces of the enemy, shattered and thinned, break away from the battle, turn, and retreat towards Gluboka. He put his bay into a gallop, Some way off were several scattered groups of Cossacks. As he rode up to the nearest of them, Grigor recognized Golubov. The commander was sitting huddled in his saddle. His sheepskin jacket was flung open. His fur cap was pushed back on his head. His brows were wet with sweat. Twisting his sergeant major whiskers, he hoarsely shouted, Myelikov, brave lad! What, are you wounded? The devil! Is the bone whole? Without awaiting an answer, he broke into a smile. We've completely smashed them, completely. We've smashed the officers' division so that they'll never be able to assemble them again. Grigor asked for a cigarette. Over all the steppe, Cossacks and Red Guards were streaming. A Cossack on horseback came galloping from a dense crowd approaching in the distance. Forty men taken, Golubov, he shouted when still a little way off. Forty officers, and Chornyatsov among them. You're lying, Golubov turned, anxiously in his saddle, and rode off to meet the prisoners, ruthlessly plying his whip across his white-stockinged horse. Gregor waited a moment, then trotted after him. The crowd of captured officers was escorted by a convoy of thirty Cossacks. Chornyatsov strode in front of the others. In an endeavor to escape, he had thrown away his sheepskin coat, and was wearing only a light leather jerkin. The epaulet had been torn from his left shoulder, and a fresh abrasion was bleeding above his left eye. He walked quickly and firmly. His fur cap set on one side gave him a carefree and youthful appearance. There was not a shadow of fear on his rosy face. Evidently he had not shaved for some days, for a growth of hair gilded his cheeks and chin. He harshly and swiftly surveyed the Cossacks running towards him, and a bitter, hateful frown darkened between his brows. He struck a match and lit the cigarette held in one corner of his firm lips. The majority of the officers were young, only one or two having traces of gray hair. One, wounded in the leg, hung back and was driven on with a butt-end by a small pockmarked Cossack. Almost at Chornyatsov's side was a tall, dashing captain. Two more walked arm in arm, smiling. Behind them came a stocky, capless Junker. Another officer had hurriedly flung a soldier's tunic around his shoulders. Yet another was hatless and had an officer's red cowl pulled down over his handsome eyes. Golubov rode behind them. He halted and shouted to the Cossack escort, Listen! You will answer with all the discipline of the military revolutionary times for the safety of these prisoners. See that they reach staff headquarters unharmed. He called a mounted Cossack to him, wrote a note, and ordered the man to give it to Podtyelkov. Then he turned to Grigor and asked, Are you going to the staff, Melyakov? Receiving an affirmative reply, Golubov rode up close to him and said, Tell Podtyelkov that I will be responsible for Chonyatsov, understand? All right, off you go. Grigor outdistanced the crowd of prisoners and rode off to the Revolutionary Committee staff, which was stationed near to a small village. He found Podtyelkov surrounded with staff officers, couriers, and Cossack orderlies. Minayev and Podtyelkov had both only just returned from the scene of the battle. 
Vyagor called Podjelka for side. The prisoners will be here in a minute, he reported. Have you received Golubov's note? Podjelkov waved his whip violently and, dropping his bloodshot eyes, shouted, Damn Golubov! It's a fine thing he's asking for. He'll take charge of Chornyatsov, will he? Take charge of that counter-revolutionary and brigand? Well, he won't. I'll have them all shot and be done with them. Golubov said he would be responsible for him, Gregor objected. I won't give him up. I've said that and I mean it. That's all. He will be tried by a revolutionary court and the sentence carried out immediately as an example to others. You know, he spoke more quietly, staring keenly at the crowd of approaching prisoners. You know how much blood he has made to flow. Oceans. How many miners has he shot? And again, stuttering with fury, his eyes rolling frenziedly, he shouted, I won't hand him over. There's nothing to shout about. Grigor also raised his voice. He was inwardly trembling as though Podjelkov had communicated his frenzy to him. You have enough judges here. You go back there. His nostrils quivering, he pointed behind him to the battlefield. There are too many of you wanting to settle accounts with the prisoners. Podjelkov retreated tightly gripping his whip in his hand. From a safe distance, he shouted, I've been there. Don't think I've been saving my skin by this cart. You keep your mouth shut, Melikov, understand? Who are you talking to? Get rid of those officer ways of yours. So, the Revolutionary Committee will judge and not any... Grigor set his horse at him and jumped out of his saddle, forgetting his wound for the moment, but he doubled up with pain and fell headlong. The blood poured from his leg. He rose without assistance, dragged himself somehow or other to a cart, and dropped with his back against the rear spring. The prisoners came up. Some of the escort mingled with the orderlies and Cossacks acting as bodyguards to the staff. The fire of the battle had not yet burnt itself out in them, and their eyes glittered feverishly and evilly as they exchanged opinions on the recent struggle. Stepping heavily over the deep snow, Podtelkov went towards the prisoners. Chornyatsov, still a little way off in front, stared at him with his clear, desperate eyes screwed up contemptuously, his left leg carelessly swinging, his upper teeth clenched over his lower lip. Podtelkov, trembling violently, went right up to him, his unwinking gaze wandering over the untrodden snow. He raised his eyes, and his stare crossed with Chornyatsov's hateful, fearless, scornful gaze. So we've caught you, you serpent, he said in a low, gurgling voice, stepping a pace backward. A wry, somber smile gashed his cheeks like a saber stroke. Betrayer of the Cossacks? Hound? Traitor? Chornyatsov spat through his teeth. Podjelkov shook his head as though avoiding a blow. His face darkened and his open mouth gasped in air. What followed occurred with astonishing speed. Chornyatsov, his teeth bared, his face pale, his fists pressed against his chest, all his body bent forward, strode towards Podjelkov. Unintelligible words mingled with curses fell from his quivering lips. Only the slowly retreating Podjelkov caught what he said. Your time will come. You know that. He raised his voice suddenly, so that the words were heard by the prisoners, the escort, and the staff officers. Well, Podjelkov hoarsely choked, fumbling for his sword hilt. There was an abrupt silence. The snow scrunched clearly beneath the feet of Minayev, Krivoshlikov, and half a dozen others, who threw themselves in Podjelkov's direction. But he outdistanced them. Turning his entire body to the right and crouching, he tore his sword from its scabbard, flung himself violently forward, and struck Chornyatsov with terrible force across the head. Grigor saw the officer shudder and raise his left hand to ward off the blow. He saw the sword cut through the wrist as though it were paper and come down on Chornyatsov's defenseless head. First the fur cap fell. Then, like corn broken at the stalk, Chornyatsov slowly dropped, his mouth twisted wryly, his eyes agonizingly screwed up and frowning as if before lightning. As the officer lay, Podtelkov sabred him again, then turned and walked away with an aged, heavy gait, wiping his blood-stained sword. Stumbling against the cart, he turned to the escort and shouted in a choking, howling voice, 
Cut them down, damn them, all of them. We take no prisoners in their hearts, in their blood. Shots rang out feverishly. The officers turned and fled in a disorderly, jostling mob. The lieutenant, with beautiful womanish eyes and a red cowl, ran with his hands clutching his head. A bullet sent him jumping high as though over a barrier. He fell and did not rise again. Two Cossacks cut down the tall captain. He caught at the blade of one sword, and the blood poured out of his hand over his sleeve. He screamed like a child, fell on his knees, onto his back, his head rolling over the snow, his face all bloodshot eyes, and a black mouth lacerated with the cry. The flying blades played over his face, his mouth, but still he shrieked in a voice thin with pain and horror. Straddling over him, a Cossack finished him off with a bullet. The Junker all but broke through the ring. He was overtaken and struck down by an Ottoman Cossack. The same man sent a bullet through the back of an officer, running with his coat flapping in the wind. The officer squatted down and grabbed with his fingers at his breast until he died. A gray-haired lieutenant was killed on the spot. As he parted with life, he dug a deep hole in the snow with his feet and would have gone on kicking like a meddlesome haltered horse if a Cossack had not taken pity on him and ended his struggles. Immediately the execution began. Grigor had burst up from the cart and, fixing his eyes on Podtelkov, had limped swiftly towards him. But Minayev seized him from behind, twisted his arms, tore the pistol out of his hand, and gazing into his eyes with a dull stare, pantingly demanded, And you, what game are you playing? Chapter 3 Flooded with a sunny glare and the blue of a cloudless sky, the blindingly brilliant snowy spine of the hill whitened and sparkled like sugar. Below the hill, a scattered village lay like a tattered blanket. To the right, little hamlets and German settlements nestled in blue patches. To the east of the village straddled another sloping hill, rent with gullies. Over its brow ran a palisade of telegraph posts. The day was unusually clear and frosty. Pillars of haze smoked in rainbow hues around the sun. The wind was blowing from the north and driving up the snow from the steppe, but the snowy expanse was clear to the horizon. Only to the east, right on the skyline, did a violet haze lurk over the steppe. Pantolyemon Prokofievich had been to Milerova to bring Grigor home. He decided not to stop at the village, but to drive on to Kashara and spend the night there. He had set out from Tatarsk in reply to a telegram from Grigor, and had found his son awaiting him at a peasant's tavern. After being wounded at Gluboka, Grigor had been a week traveling in a field hospital wagon to Milyarova. When his leg had healed a little, he resolved to go home. He went with feelings of mingled dissatisfaction and gladness. Dissatisfaction because he had abandoned his regiment at the very height of the struggle for power in the dawn, and gladness at the thought that he would see his own people again. He concealed even from himself his desire to see Oxenia, yet he could not help thinking of her. His meeting with his father was attended by a feeling of estrangement. Pantolyemon, Pyotr had been whispering in his ear, stared moodily at Grigor, and discontent and expectant anxiety lurked in his eyes. In the evening he questioned Grigor at some length about the events occurring in the Don region, and evidently his son's replies did not content him. He chewed at his gray beard, stared at his felt boots, and snorted. He entered reluctantly into argument, but flared up in defense of Kalyedin, told Grigor to shut up, as in the old days, and even stamped with his lame leg. Don't try to tell me. Kalyedin was in Tatarsk in the autumn. We had a meeting in the square, and he climbed onto a table and talked with the old men and prophesied like the Bible that the peasants would come, there would be war, and if we didn't make up our minds what we were going to do... They would take everything from us and begin to live on our land. Even then he knew there would be war. And what do you think about it, you son of a swine? Does he know less than your lot? An educated general like that who's led the army, and who is it he knows less than? The men in Kamenska are uneducated talkers like you, and they're troubling the people. Your Podjelkov, who is he? A sergeant major? Oh, uh -huh. 
A man who served with me, that's what we've come to. Gregor entered unwillingly into argument with him. He knew beforehand what attitude his father would take, and a new element had entered into the situation for him. He could not forget, he could not forgive the death of Chornyatsov and the slaughter of the officer prisoners without trial. The two horses easily drew the basket sleigh along. Gregor's saddled horse was tied behind. The well-known villages and settlements unfolded along the road. All the way to his own village, Gregor was thinking disconnectedly and aimlessly of the recent happenings, and trying at least to discern some landmarks in the future. But his mind could see no further than a rest at home. When I get back, I'll take a little rest and get my wound healed. And after that, he mentally shrugged his shoulders, we shall see, time will show. He was broken by weariness engendered of the war, he wanted to turn his back upon all the tempestuous, hate-filled, hostile, and incomprehensible world. Behind him everything was entangled, contradictory. With difficulty he had found the right path, but as soon as he had set foot upon it, the ground had risen up beneath him, the path had dwindled to nothing, and he had lost all confidence that he was on the right course. He had been drawn toward the Bolsheviks, had led others after him, then had hesitated. His heart had turned cold. Is Izvarin right after all? Who are we to trust? But when he thought that soon it would be time to get the harrows ready for spring, mangers would have to be woven of willows, and that when the earth was unclothed and dry, he would be driving out into the steppe, his labor-yearning hands gripping the plow handles, when he remembered that soon he would be breathing in the sweet scent of the young grass and the damp-smelling earth turned over by the plowshare, his heart warmed within him. He longed to collect the cattle, to toss the hay, to smell the withered scent of the clover, the twitch, the pungent smell of dung. He wanted peace and quietness, and so his harsh eyes nursed a constrained gladness as they gazed at the step, at the horses, at his father's back. Everything reminded him of his half-forgotten former life, the scent of sheepskin from his father's coat, the homely appearance of the ungroomed horses, and a cock crowing from some farmyard. Life here in this retirement seemed sweet and heavily intoxicating. They arrived at Tatarsk towards evening of the following day. From the hill, Gregor glanced towards the dawn, there were the backwaters, fringed with the sable fur of reeds. There was the withered poplar, and the crossing over the dawn was not where it used to be. The village, the familiar blocks of farms, the church, the square. As he fixed his eyes on his own farm, the blood rushed to his head, and a flood of memories overwhelmed him. The crane of the well in the yard seemed to be beckoning to him with its uplifted willow arm. A sight for tired eyes, Pantelyemon smiled, glancing round. Making no attempt to conceal his feelings, Gregor replied, Yes, and how much? What a lot home means, the old man sighed contentedly. He made for the center of the village. The horses ran swiftly down the hill, and the sleigh skidded along, bouncing from hummock to hummock. Gregor guessed his father's intention, but he asked nonetheless, what are you going to drive through the village for? Make for our own end. Pantelyemon turned and winked, smiling into his beard. I saw my sons off to the war as rank-and-file Cossacks, and they fought their way to officers' rank. Don't you think I'm proud to drive my son through the village? Let them look and be jealous. My heart is oiled with butter. In the main street he called to the horses and played with his whip, and the horses, knowing they were near home, ran freshly and swiftly as though they had not done twenty-five miles that day. The passing Cossacks bowed, the women stared under their palms from the yards and the windows, and the hens scattered, squawking over the road. Everything went as smoothly as clockwork. They drove through the square. Gregor's horse glanced sidelong at another horse tied up by Mokov's palings, snorted and raised its head high. The end of the village and the roof of Ostakov's hut were in sight, but at the first crossroad there was an awkward incident. A young pig, running across the road, lost its head, fell under the horse's hoofs, grunted and rolled over, squealing, 
and trying to raise its broken back. The devil take you, Pantelyamon cried, giving the pig a taste of his whip. Unfortunately, it belonged to Anyutka, the widow of Afonka Ozyarov, an ill-tempered and long-tongued woman. She ran out of her yard and poured out such a stream of curses that Pantelyamon reined in the horses and turned back. Hold your tongue, you fool, he shouted. What are you roaring about? We'll pay you for your mangy pig. You unclean spirit, you devil. You're mangy yourself, you limping hound. I'll have you before the ottoman at once, she screamed, waving her arms. I'll teach you to crush a poor widow's animal. Pantelyamon had heard enough, and turning livid, he croaked. Filthy mouth! You cursed Turk! the woman replied energetically. You bitch! A hundred devils were mother to you, Pantelyamon raised his voice. But Anyutka Ozirov was never at a loss for abuse. Foreigner! Whoremonger! Thief! Who stole a harrow? Who runs after the grass widows? She chattered away like a magpie. I'll give you one with this whip, you slut. Close your mouth, the old man retorted. But now Anyutka shouted something so evil that even Pantelyamon, who had seen and heard much in his time, went red with embarrassment and began to sweat. Drive on! What did you stop for? Gregor said angrily, seeing a crowd collecting and listening attentively to this fortuitous exchange of compliments between old Melyakov and the honest widow Ozirov. What a tongue! As long as a pair of reins, Pantelyamon spat out, pulverized and whipped up the horses as though he intended to ride down on Yutka herself. The blue shutters of their own hut sped past. Pyotr, with bare head and unbelted shirt, opened the gate. There was a glimmer of a white kerchief, and Dunya, with gleaming, smiling black eyes, ran down the steps. As Pyotr kissed his brother, he glanced into Grigor's eyes. Are you well? I've been wounded. Where? Near Gluboka. Did you have to shed some more blood there? You should have come home long since. He gave Grigor a warm and friendly shake and handed him on to Dunya. Grigor embraced his sister's broad shoulders and kissed her on the lips and the eyes, then stepped back in astonishment. Why, Dunya, the devil himself wouldn't know you. Look at the girl. You've turned out. And I thought you would be so stupid and ugly. Now, now, brother. Dunya turned away from his pinch and, smiling the same white-toothed smile as Grigor, she ran off. Ilinichna brought the children out in her arms, and Natalia ran in front of her. Gregor's wife had blossomed and improved astonishingly. Her smoothly combed, gleaming black hair, gathered in a heavy knot at the back, shadowed her gladly crimson face. She pressed herself against Gregor, brushed her lips awkwardly several times against his cheeks and whiskers, and snatching her son from Ilinichna's arms, held him out to her husband. Look what a fine son you have, she cried with happy pride. Let me have a look at my son, Ilinichna agitatedly pushed her aside. She pulled down Grigor's head, kissed his brow, and stroked his face with her rough hand, weeping with excitement and joy. And Quiet Flows the Dawn by Mikhail Sholokhov continued. She pulled down Grigor's head, kissed his brow, and stroked his face with her rough hand, weeping with excitement and joy. And your daughter, Grigor, here, take her. Natalia set the girl in Grigor's other arm, and in his embarrassment he did not know whom to look at, Natalia or his mother or his children. The little boy, with morose eyes and knitted brows, was cast in the Melyakov mold. The same long slits of black, rather stern eyes, blue, swollen whites, the spreading line of brows and swarthy skin. He thrust his dirty little fist into his mouth and stared stubbornly and unyieldingly at his father. Grigor could see only the tiny, attentive black eyes of his daughter. The rest of her face was wrapped in a kerchief. Holding them both in his arms, he moved towards the steps, but his leg was shot through with pain. Take them, Natalia, he laughed wryly and guiltily, or I shan't be able to get up the stairs. 
Daria was standing in the middle of the kitchen, tidying her hair. She smiled and came jauntily towards Gregor, closed her laughing eyes, and pressed her moist, warm lips against his. You taste of tobacco? She worked the delicate arches of her brows humorously. Gregor took off his sheepskin and tunic and hung them at the foot of the bed, then combed his hair. He sat down on a bench and called his son. Come to me, Misha. Why don't you know me? His fist still in his mouth, the child approached sideways, but came to a halt by the table. His mother gazed fondly and proudly at him. She bent down and whispered something into her daughter's ear and gently pushed her forward. Go on, she said. Gregor gathered them both up, set them on his knee, and asked, Don't you know me, you woodnuts? Polya, don't you know your daddy? You're not our daddy, the boy said, feeling more confident now that his sister was with him. Then who am I? You're some other Cossack. And that's that, Gregor laughed aloud. Then where is your daddy? He's away in the army, the girl said with conviction in her voice. That's right, children, give it to him. He's been away all these years, and it's high time he came home. Ilanichna intervened with feigned harshness and smiled at Gregor. Even your wife will be giving you up soon. We were already looking for a man for her. What do you say to that, Natalia? Gregor turned jokingly to his wife. She blushed, but overcoming her embarrassment, went across to him and sat down at his side. Her boundlessly happy eyes drank him in, and her burning hand stroked his dry brown arm. Daria set the table, Ilinichna called. He's got a wife of his own, Daria laughed and turned with her jaunty step towards the stove. She was as slender and elegant as ever. Her lilac woolen stockings clung tightly to her beautiful legs. Her shoes fitted her feet as though made for her. The flounced raspberry-colored skirt embraced her closely, and her embroidered apron was of an irreproachable whiteness. Gregor turned his eyes to his wife and noticed that she had changed somewhat. She had decked herself out for his homecoming. A blue satin jacket with lace sleeves tight at the wrists displayed her shapely figure and swelled over her soft, large breasts. A blue skirt with a full, crinkled, embroidered hem clasped her waist. Gregor looked at her sturdy legs, her swollen belly, and her broad bottom, like that of a well-fed mare, and thought, you can tell a Cossack woman among a thousand. She dresses herself to show everything. Look if you want to, and don't if you don't. But you can't tell the back from the front of a peasant woman. She covers her body in a sack. Ilinichna caught his gaze and vaingloriously boasted, See how officers' wives dress among us Cossacks? They could rub shoulders with any town lady. How can you talk like that, mother? Daria interrupted her. We should look fine among the town ladies. One of my earrings is broken and the other isn't worth a grosh, she ended bitterly. Gregor put his arm across his wife's broad back and thought, She's good-looking. Anybody can see that. How did she live without me? I expect the Cossacks ran after her and maybe she ran after one of them. Suppose she did. At this unexpected thought, his heart beat violently, and he stared searchingly at her rosy, shining face. Natalia flushed beneath his attentive gaze and whispered, What are you looking at me like that for? Glad to see me again? Why, of course. He drove away his unpleasant thought, but for a moment he almost hated his wife. Pantoljemin came in coughing, crossed himself before the icon, and croaked, Well, good health to you all once more. Praise be, old man. Are you frozen? We've been waiting for you. The soup's hot. Ilinichna bustled around, clattering the spoons. He untied the red handkerchief around his neck, pulled off his sheepskin, shook the icicles from his beard and whiskers, and sitting down by Gregor said, I'm all frozen, but we were warm enough coming through the village. We drove over Anyutka Ozirov's pig. How she came running out, the bitch, how she carried on. I'll give it to you, and you're this, that, and the other, and who stole a harrow? The devil knows what harrow. He detailed all the nicknames Anyutka had called him, ignoring only her reference to his whoremongering. Gregor laughed and sat down at the table. Seeking to justify himself in his son's eyes, Pantoljemin ended fierily, 
I'd have given her a taste of the whip, but Grigor was with me, and it wasn't a good moment. Pyotr opened the door, and Dunya entered, leading in a handsome young calf by a girdle. We shall be having pancakes with cream at Shrovetide, Pyotr cried gaily, thrusting the calf forward with his foot. After dinner, Grigor untied his sack and distributed his presents. That's for you, mother, he said to her, giving her a warm shawl. Frowning and blushing like a young girl, Ilinichna took the shawl and threw it around her shoulders. She spent so much time admiring herself in the glass that even Pantoljemon was riled. You old hag, fussing about in front of the glass, pa! he exclaimed. And that's for you, father, Gregor said hurriedly, untying a new Cossack cap with a raised front and a flaming red band. God save you, I was needing a new cap. There haven't been any in the shop all this past year. I don't like going to church in my old one. It was only fit for a scarecrow, but I went on wearing it, he said in indignant tones, looking around as though afraid someone would take away his son's present. He turned to go to the glass to see how it fitted, but caught Ilinichna's eyes, wheeled suddenly round, and limped to the samovar. He stood before it to try his cap on, setting the peak jauntily to one side. "'What are you doing there, you old wire?' Ilinichna rounded on him, but Pantaleamon barked back, "'Lord, what a fool you are, woman! This is a samovar, not a looking-glass!' Grigor gave his wife a length of woolen cloth for a skirt." His children received a pound of honey cake, Daria a pair of silver earrings, Dunya material for a jacket, and Pyotr cigarettes and tobacco. While the women were chattering away over their gifts, Pantoljemon strutted about the kitchen like a lord, with his chest thrown out. There's a fine Cossack of the lifeguard regiment for you, Pyotr said admiringly. Took prizes, too. Won the first prize at the Imperial Review. A saddle and all its equipment. Oh, you... Gregor laughed. The men lit cigarettes, and Pantaljemon, glancing uneasily at the window, said to him, Before the relations and neighbors begin to come, tell Pyotr what's happening back there. Gregor waved his hand. They're fighting, he replied. Where are the Bolsheviks? Pyotr immediately asked, as he seated himself more comfortably. Coming from three sides, from Tikarietz, from Taganrok, and Varanyezh. Well... And what does your revolutionary committee think about that? Why are they letting them come onto our land? Kristonia and Ivan Alexievich came back and told us all sorts of yarns, but I don't believe them. It's not as they say. The revolutionary committee is helpless. The Cossacks are running home. And is that why it's leaning on the Soviets? Of course that's why. Pyotr was silent while he puffed at his cigarette. Then he opened his eyes wide at his brother. And what side are you on? he asked. I want a Soviet government. The fool, Pantaljemin exploded like gunpowder. Pyotr, you tell him. Pyotr smiled and clapped his brother on the shoulders. He's as fiery as an unbroken horse, he said. Can anyone tell him anything, father? There's nothing to tell me, Gregor grew angry. I'm not blind. What are the front-line men in the village saying? What are the front-line men to do with us? Don't you know that fool of the Christonia by now? What can he understand? The people are all lost and don't know which way to turn. It's only misery everywhere. Pyotr waved his hand and bit his whisker. Try to see what will happen in the spring and you won't have a notion. At the front we played at being Bolsheviks, but now it's time we came back to our senses. We don't want anything belonging to anybody else. But don't you touch ours. That's what the Cossacks ought to say to all who come whining to us. It's a dirty business that's been going on at Kamienska. They've got friendly with the Bolsheviks, and they'll set up their system. You think it over, Grigor, his father said. You're not a fool. You must understand that once a Cossack, always a Cossack. Stinking Russia ought not to govern us. And do you know what the foreigners are saying now? All the land ought to be divided up equally amongst all. What do you think of that? We'll give land to those foreigners who have been living in the dawn for years. Not an inch, Pantaljemon swore setting his hook nose close to Gregor's face. There was a tramp of feet on the steps outside, and Anikushka, Christonia, and Ivan Tamilin entered. Hello, Gregor. Pantaljemon Prokofievich, what about a drink to celebrate his homecoming? Christonia roared. At his shout, the calf, dozing by the stove, started up in alarm, tottering on its still feeble legs, 
and gazing with agate eyes at the newcomers. In its fright, it let a fine stream onto the floor. Dunya stopped it with a tap on the back, wiped up the pool, and set a dirty pot under the animal. You frightened the calf, you trumpet, Ilinichna angrily exclaimed. Grigor shook hands with the Cossacks and invited them to sit down. Soon other Cossacks from the far end of the village arrived. As they talked, they smoked so much that the lamp began to sputter and the calf to choke. The fever take you, Ilinichna cursed them as she sent the guests packing at midnight. Go out into the yard and smoke, you chimneys. Clear out, clear out. Our Gregor hasn't had any rest yet after his journey. Clear off in God's name. Next morning, Gregor was the last to awake. He was aroused by the noisy, spring-like chatter of the sparrows in the eaves and outside the window frames. A golden drift of sunlight was sifting through the chinks in the shutters. The church bell was ringing from matins, and he remembered that it was Sunday. Natalia was not at his side, but the feather bed still retained the warmth of her body. Evidently, she had not long been up. Natalia, he called. Dunya entered. What do you want, brother? she asked. Open the window and call Natalia. What is she doing? She's helping mother. She'll come in a minute. Natalia came in, screwing up her eyes in the twilight of the room. Her hands smelt of fresh dough. Without rising, he embraced her and laughed as he recalled the night. You overslept yourself, he said. Aha, uh -huh. the night tired me out, she smiled and blushed, hiding her head against Gregor's hairy chest. She helped him to dress his wound, then drew his best trousers out of the chest and asked, Will you wear your officer's tunic with the crosses? No, why? He waved her off in alarm, but she pleaded importunately, Do wear it. Father will be pleased. Why did you win them if you're going to let them lie in the chest? He yielded to her entreaties. He rose, borrowed his brother's razor, shaved, and washed his face and neck. Shaved the back of your neck? Piotr asked. Oh, the devil, I forgot it. Well, sit down and I'll do it. The cold lather burnt his neck. Reflected in the glass, he saw his brother wielding the razor, his tongue sticking out at one corner of his mouth. Your neck's got thinner, like a bull does after plowing, Piotr smiled. Well, you don't grow fat on army victuals. Gregor put on his tunic with its officer's epaulets and row of heavy crosses, and when he glanced into the steaming mirror, he hardly recognized himself. A tall, gaunt officer as swarthy as a gypsy stared back at him. You look like a colonel, Piotr exclaimed in delight, without the least trace of envy in his voice, as he admired his brother. The words pleased Gregor despite himself. He went into the kitchen. Daria stared at him admiringly, while Dunya cried, Foo, how elegant you look! At this, Ilinichna could not restrain her tears. Wiping them away with her dirty apron, she replied to Dunya's banter, You have children like that, you hussy. I've had two sons and they've both got on in the world. Gregor threw his greatcoat around his shoulders and went out into the yard. Because of his wounded leg, he found it difficult to get down the steps. I'll have to use a stick, he thought, as he held on to the balustrade. The bullet had been removed at Milyarova, but the scab had drawn the skin tight, and he could not bend his leg properly. The cat was sunning itself on the ledge of the hut wall. The snow was melting into a pool around the steps. Gregor stared gladly and observantly around the yard. Right by the steps stood a post with a wheel fastened across its top. It had been there ever since he was a child, being used by the women. At night they stood at the top of the steps and placed the milk jugs on it, and during the day the pots and household utensils dried on it. Certain changes in the yard struck his eyes at once. The door of the granary had been painted with brown clay instead of paint, the shed had been rethatched with still yellow rye straw. The pile of stakes seemed smaller. Probably some had been used to repair the fence. The hummock of the earth cellar was blue with ashes. A raven-black cock, surrounded by a dozen or so variegated hens, was perched on it with one leg raised limply. The farm implements were stored under the shed for the winter. The ribbed side frames of the wagons were stood up, and some metal part of the reaping machine burned in a ray of sunlight that pierced through a hole in the roof. Geese were squatting on a pile of dung by the stable, 
and a crested Dutch gander squinted arrogantly at Gregor as he limped past. He went all over the farm, then returned to the hut. The kitchen smelt sweetly of warmed butter and hot bread. Dunya was washing some pickled apples. He glanced at her and asked with sudden interest, Is there any salted watermelon? Go and get him some, Natalia, Ilinichna called. Pantoliemon returned from church. He divided the wafer into nine parts, a bit for each member of the family, and distributed it around the table. They sat down to breakfast. Piotr, also dressed up for the occasion, even his moustaches, greased with some fat, sat at Gregor's side. Opposite them, Daria balanced herself on the edge of a stool. A pillar of sun rays poured over her rosy, shining face, and she screwed up her eyes and discontentedly lowered the black arches of her gleaming brows. Natalia fed the children with baked pumpkin. Dunya sat at her father's side, while Ilinichna was at the end of the table nearest the stove. As always on holidays, they ate a hearty meal. The cabbage soup with lamb was followed by homemade vermicelli. Then mutton, a chicken, cold lamb's trotters, potatoes baked in their jackets, wheat gruel with butter, vermicelli with dried cherries, pancakes and clotted cream, and salted watermelon. After the heavy meal, Gregor rose with difficulty, drunkenly crossed himself, puffed, and lay down on the bed. Pantoliemon was still tackling the gruel, making a hole with his spoon. He poured the amber-melted butter into it and drew up a spoonful of the greasy mess. Piotr, who was very fond of children, sat feeding Misha and playfully anointing the lad's cheeks and nose with sour milk. Uncle, don't play about, the boy objected. Why, what's the matter? What are you putting it all over my face for? Well, what of it? I'll tell Mama. Misha's morose eyes glittered angrily, and tears of vexation trembled in them. He wiped his nose with his fist and shouted in despair of persuading Piotr with fair words. Don't do it, stupid fool. Piotr only burst into a roar of laughter, and again anointed his nephew on the nose and mouth. Dunya sat down by Gregor and told him, Piotr's just a big stupid. He's always up to some new trick. The other day he went with Misha out into the yard, and the boy badly wanted to go, and asked, Uncle, can I go by the steps? But Piotr said, No, you mustn't. Go a little farther off. Misha ran a little way and asked, Here? No, no, run to the granary. From the granary he sent him to the stable, from the stable to the threshing floor. He made the poor boy run and run until he did it in his trousers, and Natalia did go on at him. Gregor listened with a smile to Piotr and Misha, and rolled himself a cigarette. His father came across to him. I'm thinking of driving to Vyshenska today, the old man confided. What for? Pantoliemon belched heavily with the food he had eaten and stroked his beard. I've got some business with the saddler. He's had two yokes of ours to mend. Coming back today? Why not? I'll be back in the evening. After a rest, the old man harnessed the mare, which had gone blind that year, into the shafts of the sledge, and drove off. In two hours or so he was at Vyshenska. He went to the post office, then to the saddler, and collected the yokes. Then he drove to an old acquaintance and gossip who lived by the new church. The man, a thoroughly hospitable sort, made him stay to dinner. Been to the post? he asked as he poured something into a glass. Yes, Pantoliemon answered, staring in astonishment at the bottle and sniffing the air like a hound tracking an animal. Then you've heard the news. News? No, I've heard nothing. What is it? Kalyedin. Alexey Maximovich Kalyedin has gone to his rest. What are you saying? Pantoliemon turned noticeably green, forgot the suspect bottle and its scent, and threw himself back in his chair. Blinking moodily, his host told him, We've had the news by the telegraph that he shot himself the other day in Novichirkas, and he was the one real general in all the province. What a spirit the man had. He wouldn't have let any shame come onto the Cossacks. Wait a bit, what's going to happen now? Pantoliemon asked distractedly, pushing away the glass offered him. God knows, bad days are coming. I fear a man wouldn't put a bullet into himself if the times were good. What made him do it? His host, a man as conservative as Pantoliemon himself, waved his hand angrily. The front-line men had deserted him and had let the Bolsheviks into the province. 
And so the Ottoman went. I doubt we'll find any more like him. Who will defend us? A Revcom or something has been set up in Kamienska with front-line Cossacks in it. And here, have you heard? We've had an order from Kamienska to get rid of the Ottomans and to elect Revcoms in their place. The peasants are beginning to raise their heads. All these carpenters, smiths, and job hunters, they're as thick in Vyshenska as midges in a meadow. Pantelyemon sat a long time silent, his gray head drooping. When he looked up, his gaze was stern and harsh. What is that you've got in the bottle, he asked. Spirits. A relation brought it from the Caucasus. Well, pour it out, friend. We'll drink to the memory of the dead Ottoman. May the heavenly kingdom open to him. They drank. The daughter of the house, a tall, long-lashed girl, brought in food. At first, Pantelyemon glanced at the mare, standing morosely by the sledge, but his host assured him, Don't worry about the horse. I'll see that she's fed and watered. Over the burning conversation and the bottle, Pantelyemon soon forgot his horse and all else in the world. He talked disconnectedly about Gregor, fell into an argument with his tipsy host, went on arguing, and then quite forgot what it was all about. It was evening when he started to his feet. Ignoring an invitation to stay the night, he decided to set off home. His friend's son harnessed the horse, and his host assisted him into the sledge. Then the man thought he would see him out of the village. They lay down together in the bottom of the sledge and embraced. Their sledge first hooked against the gate post, then caught in every projecting corner until they drove out into the steppe. There his host burst into tears and fell voluntarily out of the sledge. For a long time he stood on all fours, cursing and unable to rise to his feet. Pantelyemon whipped the horse into a trot and saw no more of his host crawling along the road with nose thrust into the snow, laughing happily and hoarsely pleading, Stop tickling, please, stop tickling. Warmed up with the whip, the mare moved swiftly but uncertainly at a blind trot. Soon her master, overcome by a drowsy intoxication, fell back with his head against the wall of the sledge and was silent. The reins happened to fall underneath him, and the horse, unguided and helpless, dropped into an easy walk. At the first fork she turned off the right road and made for a little village. After a few minutes she lost this road also. She struck across the open steppe, was stranded in the deep snow lying under a wood, and dropped down into a hollow. The sledge hooked against a bush, and she came to a halt. The jerk awoke the old man for a second. He raised his head and hoarsely shouted, Now, you devil, then lay down again. The horse moved on and passed the wood without mishap, successfully made her way down to the bank of the dawn, and guided by the scent of smoke, brought by the easterly wind, made for the next village. Some half-mile from the village there is a gap in the left bank of the river. Around the gap springs emerge from the sandy bank, and here the water is never frozen, even in the depth of winter, but lies in a broad, semicircular pool. The road along the riverside carefully avoids the water, making a sharp turn to one side. In springtime, when the field water pours in a mighty flood back through the gap to the dawn, a roaring whirlpool is formed. All the summer the carp lie at a great depth close to the piled driftwood fallen from the bank. The old mare directed her blind steps towards the left edge of the pool. When it was some fifty yards away, Pantelyemon turned over and half opened his eyes. Out of the black heaven, the yellow-green, unripe cherries of stars stared down at him. Night, he mistily realized, and pulled violently at the reins. Now I'll give you one, you old horseradish, he shouted at the horse. The mare broke into a trot. The scent of the nearby water entered her nostrils. She pricked up her ears and turned a blind, uncomprehending eye in the direction of her master. Suddenly the splash of swirling water came to her ears. Snorting wildly, she turned aside and tried to back. The half-melted ice at the edge of the pool crunched softly beneath her hoofs, and the snowy fringe broke away. The mare gave a snort of mortal terror. With all her strength she resisted with her hind feet, but her forefeet were already in the water, and the thin ice began to break under her hind hoofs. Groaning and crackling, the ice gave way. 
As the pool swallowed up the mare, she convulsively kicked out with one hind leg and struck the shaft. At that very moment, Pantoliemon, hearing that something was wrong, jumped from the sledge and tumbled backward. He saw the back of the sledge rise, laying bare the gleaming runners, as the front was drawn down by the weight of the mare. Then it slipped away into the green-black depths. The water, mingled with pieces of ice, hissed softly and rolled in a wave almost to his feet. With incredible swiftness he crawled backward and jumped firmly to his feet, roaring, Help! Good people! We're drowning! His drunkenness passed from him as though cut away by a saber. He ran to the pool. The freshly broken ice gleamed sharply. The wind drove bits of ice over the broad, black half-circle of the pool. The waves shook their green manes and muttered. All around was a deathly silence. The lights of the distant village shone yellow through the darkness. The stars, granular as though freshly winnowed, burned ecstatically in the plush of the sky. The breeze raised the snow from the field, and it flew hissingly in a flowery dust into the black depths of the pool. And the pool steamed a little and remained menacingly, yawningly black. Pantoliemon realized that it was useless and foolish to shout now, he looked around, discovered where he had got to in his drunken torpor, and shook with anger at himself and at what had happened. His knout was still in his hand. He had jumped out of the sledge with it. Cursing frightfully, he whipped away at his back with the lash, but it did not pain him, for his stout sheepskin softened the blows. And it seemed senseless to undress just for that pleasure. He tore a handful of hair out of his beard, and mentally counting the purchases he had lost, the value of the mare, the sledge, and the yokes, he swore frenziedly and went still closer to the pool. You blind devil, your mother was, he said in a trembling, moaning voice, addressing the drowned mare. You chicken, drowned yourself and all but drowned me. Where is the unclean spirit taken you? The devils will harness you up and drive you, but they won't have anything to touch you up with. Here, take the whip, too, he flung the cherry knout desperately around his head and flung it into the middle of the pool. It smacked and pierced the water stock first and disappeared into the depths. Chapter 4 The first sight to meet Bunchuk's gaze when he returned to consciousness was Anna's black eyes glittering with tears and a smile. For three weeks he had been delirious, for three weeks he had wandered in another intangible and fantastic world. His senses returned to him towards the evening of January 6th. He stared at Anna with serious, filmy eyes, trying to recall all that was associated with her, but only partly succeeding. Most of his recent past was still inflexibly concealed in the depths of his memory. Give me a drink, he heard his own voice coming from afar off, and he smiled with amusement at it. He stretched out his hand for the cup held by Anna, but she pushed it aside. You must drink from my hand, she said. He felt a stirring of gratitude towards her. Trembling with the effort of lifting his head, he drank, then fell wearily back onto the pillow. He lay staring at the wall, wanting to say something, but his weakness took the upper hand, and he dozed off. When he awoke, it was again Anna's anxious, troubling eyes that first met his own, then he noticed the saffron light of the lamp and the white circle cast by it on the bare planks of the ceiling. Anna, come here. She approached and took his hand. He replied with a feeble pressure. How do you feel, she asked. My tongue belongs to someone else, my head belongs to someone else, and my legs also, and I feel as though I am two hundred years old. He carefully enunciated every word. After a silence, he asked, have I had typhus? Yes. His eyes wandered around the room, and he asked indistinctly, Where are we? In Tsaritsin. And you? How is it you're here? I stayed with you. And as though justifying herself or trying to avert some unexpressed thought of his, she hastened to add, We couldn't leave you entirely to strangers, so Abramson and the comrades of the committee asked me to look after you. And so, you see, I had quite unexpectedly to come with you. He thanked her with a look and a weak movement of his hand. And Krutogorov, he asked, he's gone to Lugansk. And Gevorkyans, he, you see, 
he died of typhus. They were both silent, as though paying respect to the memory of the dead. I was afraid for you. You were very ill, she said quietly. And Bagavoy? I've lost touch with them all. Some of them went to Kamienska. But is it all right for you to talk? And wouldn't you like a drink of milk? Bunchuk shook his head. He turned awkwardly over. His head swam and the blood rushed to his eyes. Feeling her cool palm on his brow, he opened his eyes. One question was tormenting him. He had been unconscious, and who had attended to his needs? Surely not she. A faint flush colored his cheek, and he asked, Did you have to look after me all by yourself? Yes. The fever had left him with the complication of slight deafness. The doctor sent by the Tsaritsyn party committee told Anna that it would be possible to cure it only when he was thoroughly well again. He made slow progress. He had a wolfish appetite, but Anna strictly apportioned his diet. There was more than one quarrel between them on this account. Give me some more milk, he would ask. You can't have any more. I ask you, give me some more. Do you want me to die of starvation? Ilya, you know that I mustn't give you more than a certain amount. He lapsed into an injured silence, turned his face to the wall, sighed and refused to talk. Although suffering with an almost motherly tenderness for him, she would not yield. After a little while, he turned back, his face clouded, and so looking even more unhappy, and pleaded, Can't I have some pickled cabbage? Please, Anna, dear, listen to me. It's all doctor's fairy stories that it's not good for you. Always meeting with a decided refusal, he sometimes wounded her with harsh remarks. You have no right to make sport of me like this. You're an unfeeling and heartless woman. I'm beginning to hate you. That would be the best payment I could have for what I've gone through in nursing you. She could not restrain herself. I didn't ask you to stay with me. It's not fair to reproach me with that. You're exploiting your position. All right, don't give me anything. Let me die. Great is pity. Her lips trembled, but she kept her self-command and patiently endured all. But once, after they had quarreled over an extra helping of dinner, with tightened heart she noticed tears glittering in his eyes. Why, you're a perfect child, she exclaimed, and ran to the kitchen to bring back a full plate of patties. Eat, eat, Ilya, dear. Don't get angry any more. Here's an extra nice one. With trembling fingers, she thrust a patty into his hands. Suffering intensely, Bunchuk attempted to refuse, but he could not hold out. Wiping away his tears, he sat up and ate the patty. A guilty smile slipped over his emaciated face, and asking forgiveness with his eyes, he said, I'm worse than a child. You see, I almost cried. She looked at his terribly thin neck, at the sunken, fleshless chest visible through the open shirt collar, at his bony arms, troubled by a deep love and pity, for the first time she simply and tenderly kissed his dry yellow brow. Only after a fortnight was he able to move about the room without assistance. His spidery legs collapsed under him, and he had to learn to walk. Look, Anna, I can walk, he exclaimed and tried to move more quickly. But his legs could not support the weight of his body, and the floor broke from his feet. Compelled to lean against the first support to hand, he smiled broadly, and the skin on his translucent cheeks tightened into furrows. He laughed an agedly jarring, miserable little laugh, and weak with his efforts, fell back onto the bed. Their rooms were close to the quay. From the window, they could see the snowy stretch of the Volga, Beyond it, forests sweeping in a dark half-circle, and the soft, undulating outlines of distant fields. Anna often stood by the window, thinking over the strange and violent change that had occurred in her life. Bunchuk's illness had brought them very close together. But even before that, after their first meetings in Rostov, she had realized with an inward chill and tremor that she was bound to this man by inseverable bonds. Out of due season, in a time of menacing events, in the nineteenth spring of her life, as brief as a dream, her feelings had taken charge of her and driven her towards Bunchuk. Plain and simple as he was, her heart had chosen him. In battle, struggles, 
She had become one with him. She had robbed death of him, had pulled him through. At first, when after a long and arduous journey they had arrived at Tsaritsyn, her life had been burdensome and bitter to the point of tears. Never before had she had to look so closely and nakedly at the reverse side of living with one beloved. Clenching her teeth, she had changed his linen, combed the insects out of his lousy head, and with shuddering and aversion had glanced stealthily at his naked, masculine body, at the envelope beneath which the dear life was hardly warm. Everything in her had risen up and revolted, but the external filth could not crush the deeply and faithfully preserved feeling. Under its powerful command, she had learnt to overcome her pain and incomprehension, and at last all that was left was compassion and a deep well of love which beat and soaked through to the surface. Once Bunchuk happened to ask her, I suppose I'm repellent to you after all this, aren't I? It was a hard test. What of, your self-control? No, my feelings. He turned away, and for long could not restrain his lips from trembling. They did not refer again to the subject. Words would have been superfluous and colorless. When he returned to health, their friendly relations were not troubled by a single misunderstanding. He seemed to be trying to compensate her for all she had suffered for him, and was exceptionally attentive, anticipating her every wish, but doing it unobtrusively, with an unwanted gentleness. With eyes rough, yet humble and full with boundless devotion, he watched her. At the end of January, they went to Varignage. As she stared from the rear platform of the carriage at the retreating town of Tsaritsyn, she laid her hand on his shoulder and said, as though completing the conversation they had left unfinished, We came together in extraordinary circumstances. Perhaps it would have been better not to. I say that with my head and not with my heart, of course. And do you know why I say it? Look. She pointed to the snowy step, lying like an enormous glittering silver ruble. Out there, life is fermenting. It calls for the application of all one's strength. And I think at such times, feeling dissipates our concentration on the struggle. We should have met earlier or else later. That's not true, he smiled and pressed her to himself. You and I will be one, and that will not only not weaken our concentration, but on the contrary it will strengthen it. It's easy to break one twig, but more difficult to break two intertwined. Not a very good example, Ilya. Perhaps not, but all this talk leads nowhere. That's true, and besides I'm not so very sorry that we... She was embarrassed and hesitated. Have half come together... The personal cannot stifle our desire to struggle. And conquer, damn it, he finished for her, squeezing her little militantly closed fist in his hand. The fact that they had not yet come together physically gave their relationship a childlike, agitatingly tender quality. They were not oppressed by the desire to cross the last barrier to their complete union. This circumstance gave Anna cause for agitated joy, and as she thought of it, she asked, our relations are not at all like what they usually are in such cases, are they? Our landlady in Tsaritsyn and everybody else thought we were man and wife, didn't they? How good it is, if only because we have got beyond the petty restrictions of the everyday. In the struggle, you and I came to love each other and succeeded in preserving our feeling without soiling it with anything bestial, earthly. Romanticism, he laughed. What? she inquired. He silently stroked her head. She stared with misty eyes at the snowy expanse, at the distant, indistinct outlines of villages, at the lilac contours of copses, at the gashes of ravines. She spoke hurriedly, and her voice was low and crooning in timbre, like a violoncello. And besides, how poisonous and petty seems any care for the achievement of one's own individual little happiness at the present time. What does it signify in comparison with the uncompassable human happiness which suffering humanity will achieve through the revolution? Isn't that so? We must be wholly absorbed into this struggle for liberation. We must, must fuse with the collective group and forget ourselves as isolated parts. Gently, like a child in sleep, she smiled at the corners of her tender yet strong mouth, and a wavering shadow lay on her upper lip because of her smile. You know, Ilya... 
I perceive the future life like a distant, distant, magically beautiful music, just as one sometimes hears it in sleep. Do you hear music in your sleep? It is not a separate, slender melody, but a mighty, growing, perfectly harmonized hymn.